This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Okay, we need need to know something about uh, liquidations because part of company law, obviously, we've looked at formation and birth of companies, and we've looked at the continuing running of companies and the directors and their responsibilities and duties and the members and what they do and the meetings that are held, the resolutions that are being passed. Now we come to the death of companies. I did mention in an earlier lecture that um, unlike uh, humans, even though a company is a, um, a person in law, a separate legal entity, but just a, as much a person as you or, or as me, even though that is the case, they do differ in certain ways. I mentioned in an earlier lecture too that we can be of no fixed permanent residence, but a company has to have a residential address, a place where you can serve notice or where you can keep the registers that are required to be kept. But another major difference is that um, companies have perpetual succession. You, they're unaffected by the death of a member, whereas, uh, listen, you're going to have to face it, it you will die, it, me probably a lot earlier than you, but nevertheless, it, it faces us because we're humans. Companies don't have that problem, if it is a problem. Companies have perpetual succession and can go on and on and on and on. The East India Trading Company and the Hudson Bay Fur Trading Company, these are companies which were formed years and years and years and years, hundreds of years ago, and yet they're still going. So there's no reason why a company necessarily couldn't go on forever. Incidentally, that's one of the objectives of the new principles of corporate governance is that companies should enjoy longevity and that one of the reasons for employing non-executive directors is that those directors will ensure that the executive directors have got long-termism in mind because, and I've said this before, because nobody wins in a liquidation except one person, the liquidator. Nobody else. Employees, suppliers, customers, taxmen, government, everybody loses except the liquidator. So here we are with liquidations. And there are two, basically, a subdivision of two. Compulsory, where the court says, you're going into liquidation. I was trying to say how we can have differences between people and, and companies. We can kill ourselves if we want. We can commit suicide or we can be killed. We can be hung, we can be shot, we can be run over, we can just die of natural causes. All sorts of things can happen to us to end our life. But a company has this ability to perpetually succeed into the future. But you can find that companies do get killed. They can either be murdered or they can commit suicide. The murder is compulsory. It's where the court says, you, you're finished. We're going to appoint a person Dr. Death. We're going to appoint a, a, a person called the liquidator and that liquidator is going to move in and he's going to sell all your assets and collect all the money and pay all the money out to the various people who are entitled to it and then strike the company off. Tell the registrar of companies to, to get rid of this company completely. And so that's murder. That's the way that a company may be compulsorily liquidated. But it is possible for a company also to commit suicide. The same as we can, in a number of ways we can commit suicide. There are two ways in which a company may commit suicide, and there's a particularly perverted way where members can commit the suicide of the company but ask for the courts to make sure that they're doing it right. So that's, and that's all I'm going to say about uh, voluntary liquidation under the supervision of the court. That's all I'm going to mention about that method because it's very, very rare. But otherwise, we have two voluntary ways. We can either have a member's voluntary liquidation or a creditor's voluntary liquidation. They're called winding up, member's voluntary winding up, creditor's voluntary winding up. Now then, in a member's voluntary winding up, who is it that puts the company into liquidation? In a member's voluntary winding up, who puts the company into liquidation? The answer is the members. In a creditor's voluntary winding up, 
who is it that puts the company into liquidation? In a creditor's voluntary winding up, who puts the company into liquidation? It's the members. It's the members of the company that put the company into a creditor's voluntary liquidation. Don't get confused. This is a voluntary act by the company to commit suicide. This is an act by the members coming together and passing a special resolution that says, let's finish this company. A variety of reasons. Maybe it's a private company, just husband and wife. Maybe they're getting divorced, so they get together and say, let's liquidate the company, go our separate ways. It may be that they foresee, they're still happily together, but they foresee that they're not going to be able to continue perpetually into the future. They don't have any children, nobody wants to buy it from them. Let's quit while the going is still good. Before it gets into a bad situation, let's just close the company down. It may be that a parent company has just acquired a subsidiary, taken all the trade, the business, the assets, merged them into itself, and is now just going to close down the subsidiary. So a number of reasons why you might want to, to put the company into a voluntary liquidation. But that's okay. That's a member's voluntary liquidation. The difference between a member's and a creditor's voluntary liquidation is solvency. The company can no longer continue. It cannot afford to pay its debts as they fall due. The directors recognize the situation. They say, members, quick, get together and let's put the company into liquidation before it goes any worse. If the directors carry on, then they do so knowing, or should have known, that the company would be unable to pay its debts as they fall due. And therefore, if that's the situation, the directors are committing a criminal act by allowing the company to continue. We'll get onto that when we start looking at criminal activities, at fraudulent and criminal activities. So the directors call the members together and say, look, we're in deep financial trouble. Before it goes any worse, will you help us? Will you put the company into liquidation? You members put the company into liquidation. And it's called the creditor's voluntary liquidation because the creditor's rights are being adversely affected. It is likely that they will not be paid in full. And if they're not paid in full, the members are certainly going to get nothing. Members get nothing until all the creditors have been paid in full. So that's the difference. Solvency is the key. What does it matter? Members voluntary liquidation, the company is solvent. The company will appoint a liquidator. The liquidator can see that the company is solvent, sell the assets, pay off the creditors, dissolve the company, everything's fine. Creditors voluntary liquidation, the company is not solvent. It cannot pay its debts. The members liquidation, the directors can choose who they wish to be liquidated. It has to be a qualified insolvency practitioner has to be appropriately qualified. In a creditor's voluntary liquidation, the directors can nominate, the members can nominate a liquidator, who they would like to see. But it's the creditors that have the final say as to the identity of the liquidator that is appointed. So in a creditor's voluntary liquidation, it's the creditor's choice that sees who is to be the liquidator. And that may be also a qualified insolvency practitioner. That may be quite important in terms of questioning earlier transactions. If the company is solvent, the liquidator sells the assets, pays everyone off, and away we go. If it's not solvent, what are the reasons for it not being solvent? Have the directors been guilty of fraudulent preferencing? Have they been selling goods to connected persons at an undervalue? Have they been breaching other? Have they created a debenture in favor of a connected person within the two years prior to the commencement of a liquidation? The, the creditor's voluntary liquidation liquidator may not be quite so amenable as the member's voluntary liquidator because in the member's voluntary liquidation, everyone's going to be paid in full. Ah, you say, 
Well, why not appoint your own as a member of voluntary liquidation, get it going, move it around until, oh, six months down the line, our liquidator says, oh dear, we're not going to be able to pay all your creditors after all. Sorry. If that happens, we have to switch from members to creditors voluntary liquidation immediately and the directors are automatically found guilty of signing a declaration of solvency carelessly or recklessly or without due care and attention and are therefore criminally liable. It's a big deal to sign a declaration of solvency without taking every precaution. The court gets involved. Here we're looking at compulsory again. The court gets involved. The court's not going to wait. No judge is going to wake up in the morning and say, I think we'll put four companies into liquidation today. Now then, who shall it be? It doesn't work like that, clearly. So you have to approach the court and you have to say, Your Honour, these are the circumstances behind my application. I would like you to put the company into liquidation. So there are situations that have to, one or, they don't all have to apply, any one of them of which, if it applies, the court may grant you a liquidation order. They may do. First of all, if the members have passed a special resolution, if the members can pass a special resolution, so that the company has to go to court and ask for the court to be for the court to grant an order of liquidation. Why did they not pass a special resolution simply to put the company into a, a voluntary liquidation? I don't know. I don't know the niceties, the reasons why the members can pass a special resolution to ask the court, why they couldn't equally pass the special resolution to put the company into voluntary liquidation and avoid the extreme expense of court hearings. I don't know. Failure to obtain a trading certificate. Failure to obtain a trading certificate within 12 months of incorporation only applies to PLCs because private companies don't need trading certificates. Why would you create a PLC? Why would you create a public company that needs a trading certificate in order to commence trading? And then decide not to bother. Well, if somebody applies to the court and says, this public company hasn't acquired a trading certificate, has failed to obtain one, then the court will say, dead, kill you, compulsory liquidation. The court may not, it may, may say to the directors, the, the beneficial owners, why have you not obtained a trading certificate? Is there any reason why you've not obtained a trading certificate? And difficult to imagine one, but possible. Suspension of business for 12 months or failure to commence business within 12 months of incorporation. I had a company. I had my own company when I was teaching abroad. I had my own company. I've since closed that company. I've not... I've suspended trading. It's not formally been liquidated. I've just walked away from it, basically. So the local Secretary of State or the local Department of Trade will presumably have, because I no longer live in that country, presumably the, the local department has said liquidated it's a suspension of business. I paid all my taxes. All my taxes were, were paid up to date, so I don't think I'm evading any tax. Unable to pay this, this is this is the big one, this is the one which is most frequent, where creditors will approach the court and say, this company owes me money and they won't pay me, will you liquidate the company for me? This is, this is the major one, the one where most compulsory liquidation orders are granted, and I shall come back to it in, in a very short amount of time. Finally, just an equitable. Just an equitable is a sort of fail-safe where the court has got it within its power. We don't satisfy any of these any of these others. We, we don't pass a special resolution. We have got a certificate. We didn't suspend our business. We are able to pay our debts. 
but really it's not right that the company should be allowed to continue will you put it into liquidation and the court says just and equitable yes liquidate only a couple of examples there aren't many examples of just and equitable the court doesn't want to get involved why should the court be involved but if it's fair that the court should be involved then the court will step in i'll give you the examples um, in, in a couple of minutes but i want to talk about an inability to pay your debts within 12 months and here we are you need to show the court that the company has owed you 750 pounds for more than 21 days think about that they have owed you not less than 750 pounds for not less than three weeks i can't remember many instances where I raised an invoice, when I had a company, when I raised an invoice against other companies, firms of auditors, companies, firms of auditors, and, and they paid me within 21 days, and it was more than £750, and they paid within 21 days. So at any one of those occasions, I could have gone to court and said, really, but, and I'm using, I'll pick a name at random here. In fact, I'll pick a name which no longer applies. Will you put Arthur Anderson into liquidation? Because they have owed me more than £750 for more than three weeks and, and I want my money. And the court's not going to be happy with that. For one thing, it could just be me saying, I don't like Arthur Anderson because they said they're not going to send their students to my teaching company anymore. <clears throat> so it might just be bitterness. Send them an invoice for £800 sit back and wait for three weeks and then go to court and say put them into liquidation please so that would be for the wrong reasons if, if and for uh, for no other reason the court would reject that it has to be a genuine commercial justification for me to ask for that liquidation to take place but in addition it's frivolous isn't it 750 21 days it's frivolous so what will normally happen is that a creditor will go to court and say, will you allow me to prove that my debt is a good debt? And if the court says yes, then we produce invoices and we produce delivery notes signed by the customer and we produce their order form and we produce a copy of my confirmation order and we produce records of, of the service that we have rendered and the time sheets and showing the hours and the products coming out of our accounting records. And we show all this and we prove to the court that this is a good debt and that it's not in dispute. Well, it might be in dispute. That's one of the defences. Because then the court is going to say to the creditor, do you have anything to say about this? And the creditor says, yes, it's disputed. Why is it disputed? Because we don't think the debt is good, the work is poor, blah, 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 blah. So if it's in dispute, the court's not going to get involved. If it's not in dispute, then the court will grant judgment on the debt. And judgment, having now been given judgment on the debt, it now means I can appoint a sheriff or bailiff to go and seize goods to that value in order that they can sell the goods sufficient to raise money to pay their own fees, to pay my court costs, to pay my debt. So it's going to be a lot of goods that they're seizing, particularly because when they seize these goods, they instantly become worth a lot less than their carrying value because in a forced sale, inventory is not worth anything like what you could sell it for in the ordinary course of business. So I send in the bailiffs and the, and the other sheriff using such force as may be necessary to secure property to the value enough sufficient to pay. And they go in, they knock at the door, and the door is opened, and the directors say, welcome, you take whatever you want, but you can't take that, that, you can't take that, because that's on finance lease, that doesn't belong to us. That's still, all that inventory is has been purchased under a Ramalpa clause reservation of title where the suppliers have retained title in the event of non-payment. 
So you can take, well, you can take our stationery, you can take our letter-headed paper, but that's all we have to tell us. So the bailiffs and the sheriff go away again and come back to you and say, we tried, but we couldn't get anything of value. Then you go back to court and say, the bailiffs and sheriffs went in, but they couldn't get anything of value. Will you put the company into liquidation so that at least it's it's no longer hanging over? It's no longer I'm no longer worrying about whether I'm going to get any money liquidated. And then if I get two cents in the pound or two cents in the dollar, that at least is something. And that's the situation when the court may then liquidate. Now here's interesting. The court may not. The, what the court may do is, is grant a suspension order, defer their, their decision. So they've got three things they can do. They can either reject your application, or they can grant your application, or they can defer your application and allow the directors to come and present their side of the events to say why they should not be liquidated. And so the directors come along to produce further evidence and the court may then reject your application or grant your application or may defer it again and waiting further evidence. <coughs> now in this period of deferral, it is potentially the case that the directors may start to take whatever assets there are and dispose of them, put them out of reach of a subsequent appointed liquidator. So what you can do is if the court is deferring their decision, is you can say to the court, will you appoint a provisional liquidator? Provisional upon the ultimate granting of the liquidation order, or provisional upon the dismissal of the, uh, the, the, dismissal of the claim. So the court will appoint, can appoint a provisional liquidator. And I'm going to call him provisional liquidator number one. You'll see why in a moment. And provisional liquidator number one will be the official receiver, probably. It could be a firm of counters, but probably be the official receiver. Public office, civil servant, sent in to be the provisional liquidator while we're waiting for further evidence. The provisional liquidator, quite a... What did I call him? The official receiver. Provisional liquidator, official... I've just lost the those words there. The official receiver... Very busy man, woman. So what that person can do is they can ask the court for permission to appoint a special manager. Now, if you've been remembering these legal terms, you know already that there are three specials. We've had special resolution, we've had special notice, and we've had... Uh, <laughs> what was it on? Oh dear, special resolution, special notice. I've forgotten. Maybe this was the third one. Maybe this was the three. Special resolution and special notice. I've already dealt with a link. Special notice. Ah. Special resolution, special notice. Special manager is the third. Special manager is the person that is appointed by provisional liquidator number one, the official receiver. He says to the court, can I appoint a special manager? And that special manager will be a partner from the insolvency department of one of probably one of the four major accountancy firms. So there we are with our three. Grant the application, reject the application, provisional liquidator. And eventually that one has to disappear. It's either granted or it's dismissed. If it's dismissed, that's the end of the matter. So if it's granted, the court puts the company into liquidation and then appoints the liquidator. The court says, official receiver, you are now provisional liquidator. So you are provisional liquidator number two. Provisional liquidator is waiting until the decision. Provisional liquidator number two is the decision is made, the company's in liquidation, the official receiver is now acting as provisional liquidator. Provisional upon the creditors agreeing that the official receiver shall take the reins of liquidation and, and carry out the process. But if they don't want to, then the creditors and interested parties may say, thank you very much, official receiver, but we have in mind our own uh, person that we would like to be a liquidator. 
and they are a qualified insolvency practitioner. So thank you for being provisional liquidator number two, as well as number one, for being provisional liquidator number two, but we no longer need your services because here we have another qualified insolvency practitioner to take over the liquidation. Okay. That will do for inability to pay debts and the appointment of a liquidator under compulsory liquidation. Just inequitable is the other one where rarely the court will get involved, but they do get involved. German Day Coffee Company, the substratum. <coughs> Stratum is a layer. In geology, it's a layer of rock. So in company law, and we talk about substratum, that's the basis on which the company is built. It's, that's the reason for the company's existence, the company being created. And in the case of German Day Coffee Company, this company was created, was being created, in order to acquire a German patent to manufacture coffee essence coffee essence out of date extract and it was in the process the promoter was was promoting the company getting in finance getting people to agree to be directors getting people to agree to subscribe for shares and by the time it was ready to be created and the forms to be sent to the registrar the german patent was no longer available but the swedish patent was so the promoter acquired the Swedish patent, the company set up, and it couldn't, it was unsuccessful, couldn't pay some creditors, and we're in the situation, therefore, of putting the company into liquidation. But why would it be liquidated if it could pay its creditors? Well, it could pay its creditors. It would be able to pay its creditors, windfall, within 12 months. But the substance would disappear. It was no longer able to use a German patent to make coffee essence out of date extract. So the whole reason for its existence had gone. And the court wound it up. It was the right thing to do. Just and equitable. It's the right, the fair, the honest, the, the upright thing to do. This is a nice case, you need your tobacco. You need your tobacco is about a tobacco company back in the mid 1920s where smoking was a lot more prevalent in the UK a lot more prevalent than it is thankfully nowadays and we have a private company two directors equal shareholders 50 50 and everything went fine it was a very lucrative business a lot of money a lot of profits to be made but these two directors had a disagreement and the disagreement got blown out of all proportion and they wouldn't talk to each other. So at meetings of directors, one director would say, blah, 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 and the other director ignored him. And the other one said, blah, 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 and the other one ignored him. And they eventually started passing written messages to each other through the company secretary. And the company secretary eventually went to court and said, well, will you knock the heads together of these two idiots? Because... They're, they're running the company down, there's deadlock on the board, we can't move forward, we can't. <coughs> no decisions can be made because whatever one suggests, the other disagrees, whatever the other suggests, the one disagrees. And the court said, liquidate, kill them, get rid of it, kill the company and let them go their own way. And that's what happened. Ibrahimi and Westbourne Galleries, I've already gone through this, in a, a quasi-partnership situation, I've gone through this with you in another lecture. It's about Nazar and his nephew George and how they cheated or tried to cheat Ebrahimi out of his share of this uh, Westbourne Gallery company. So I've already gone through it. I'm not going to go through that again. And in fact, I'm going to finish the lecture at this stage.